Good evening. On behalf of the Augustus Tolton Pass Union, we welcome you on this evening. We are so grateful that you joined us for this important discussion on where have all the Catholics gone? We have three dynamic panelists who are ready to engage in a fruitful discussion of not only why the Black Catholic community is declining, but also to lift up suggestions as to how we can just not just have this Catholics forward and not only secure our future, but also our legacy. At the end of the discussion, we will have time for a question and answer. Please put your questions in the chat. Gardas Watts, the Tolton Scholar, will be monitoring the chat for those questions, and we will try to get to them at, we will get to them at the end of the program. First, as in all events, we will Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> we will start with prayer with Tanya Bolin, a Tolton Scholar, followed by introductions of our panelists with Tolton Scholars, Stephanie Garrison and Latrice Winfield. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, dear Heavenly Father, we come in support as we begin tonight's discussion. We invite you into our presence and ask that you bless all in attendance. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. As we begin our panel discussion, please uplift and enlighten us. We focus our hearts and minds on you and ask that you release our cares and anything that would hinder us. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. Forgive us for having our minds set on other things and not giving you all the honor you deserve. All the glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Once again, good evening. Our very way of verse in theology, philosophy, and Black Catholic studies. They are advocates and convenes for civil and social justice and health care for the underserved and marginalized in our Black and church communities, both locally and at large. Let us meet them. First, we have Dr. Valerie D. Lewis Mosley, healer, scholar, pastoral theologian, social justice advocate, is a professional registered nurse with studies in nursing leadership at New York University. She is retired from New York Hospital, Will Cornell University Medical Center. She is a health law degree, Master of Jurisprudence from Seton Hall University Law School, magna cum laude, and a Master of Arts Pastoral Ministry, Spiritual Direction, Christian Spirituality from Immaculate Conception Seminary at Seton Hall, summa cum laude and a Doctor of Ministry degree, Healing Mind University Theological School. She is a Master of Catechism Immersion in and Formation from the Institute of Black, Study, Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University of Louisiana. Dr. Louis Mosey is lay Associate Order of Preachers, Caldwell Dominicans. She works as a social justice advocate to combat racism and disparities in healthcare access within society and the church at large. She's an adjunct professor of theology at Caldwell University Symposium. For 25 years, she served as the Director of Religious Education at Christ the King, Jersey City, a historical Black Catholic parish. She is also the, on the advisory board for Black Catholic Ministries at the Archdiocese of Newark and is currently serving on the USCCB project, Journeying Together, a discussion on youth and young adults within the church. Father Michael Trill is a, is a priest 
for the Archdiocese of Chicago, ordained by Cardinal Blaise Supich in May 2016. Currently, he serves as pastor of St. Thomas, the Apostle Catholic Church in High Park, neighborhood of Chicago. A native of Detroit, Michigan, Father Trail University, Chicago for undergrad, obtaining a bachelor's in philosophy in 2012. He went on to earn a master's of divinity degree from the University of St. Mary of the Lake, Mundelein Seminary in 2016. His personal interests include exploring the church's place in the life of the city, the intersection of faith and daily life and urban planning. Dr. Ansel Augustine is the New Orleans area director for Vagabond Missions, which is an outreach program that ministers to the most at-risk youth in the community. Additionally, he is the director of the Office of Black Catholic Ministries for the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Currently, he is also on the faculty of the Institute of Louisiana Graduate Theological Foundation in Loyola University, New Orleans, Institute for Ministry. Formerly, he was executive director of cultural diversity and outreach for the Archdiocese of Washington and served as the associate director coordinator of black youth and young adult ministry for the CYO Youth and Young Adult Ministry Office. As a campus minister at three universities, Xavier in Louisiana, Loyola, in New Orleans, and St. John's in Queens, New York. Also, he was on the board of directors for the National Catholic Young Adult Ministry Association and the National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministry. Dr. Augustine has presented workshops and keynotes around the country and has written very, very including the African American Catholic Youth Bible and leveling the praying field. Can the church we love love us back? He is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of Peter Claver, and the Wow Chapatulis Black Masking Mardi Gras Indians. In addition, he is an of the Holy Family in New Orleans, Louisiana. Let us welcome now our esteemed panelists. The purpose of tonight's conversation has been brewing for a while. Here in the Chicago Archdiocese, we have seen a steady decline in Black Catholic churches, as well as Black Catholic membership. So there were over 40 predominantly Black Catholic churches. We have just went through a process called Renew My Church. And at the end of this initiative, there will only be nine Black Catholic churches. I'm gonna let that sink in for a moment. We are going from 40 to nine. We know that the Catholic experiencing a decline in membership. And there are many reasons for this decline that we will get into in this discussion. But first I wanna give you some statistics. In the Pew Research study published about a year ago, uh, in 2021, titled Faith Among African Americans. They interviewed over 8,600 Black adults, 18 years older, from around the country. And that Black young adults are less religious 
and less engaged in black churches than older generations. Black millennials and members of Generation Z are less likely to rely on prayer, less likely to have grown up in black churches and less likely to say religion is an important part of their lives. Fewer attend religious services and those who attend are less also, according to the Pew Research Center, 19% of Blacks under 30 are unaffiliated with religion. They are called nuns, not the, the religious nuns that we're, 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 we're familiar with, but the N-O-N-E-S's. Compared with just 7% of Blacks age 65 and older, the statistics represent disparity between young people and Christianity and raises concerns about its importance on the future of the Black church. Out of the 18% nuns, nine out of the 10, however, say that they believe in God or higher power. They pray a few times a month. They pray and reflect when having to make important decisions. They believe in spirits and demons, ancestors and the saints. The distinction that we want to make is that while there's a decline in the numbers of black Catholics attending Catholic churches, they have not left Christianity. They have left though the Catholic church and have either moved to another denomination or a non-denominational congregation. One of the reasons for this move is that they feel that issues are not being addressed at the pulpit. Black Catholics are no longer willing to sit in churches and not hear about the issues that are impacting their lives every day. To start this conversation, our panelists, I want to ask you a question from your context and or experiences. Have you seen this decline in the number of Black Catholics in your respective churches? I'm going to ask the Reverend Michael Trell to start us out, followed by Dr. Valerie and then Dr. Ansel. Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for letting me be with you here today. Um, as was mentioned, I'm the pastor of St. Thomas the Apostle Catholic Church here in the Hyde Park neighborhood. Uh, actually, CT was in the boundaries of uh, St. St. Thomas, and so I'm glad to be able to collaborate with you all here this evening. Uh, Dr. Lymore asked me to share a little bit about the context and the experience about um, how Black Catholics are leaving the Catholic Church. Uh, so a little bit of history and a little bit of context uh, more than my bio. So I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and um, came to Chicago in 2007 to go to Loyola for undergrad, and then from there uh, entered the seminary system for the Archdiocese of Chicago. So in many ways, I have like a, a bi-diocesan experience, if you will. You know, I have my, my, my faith experience growing up in Detroit and the, the lived experience of being a Black Catholic in the Archdiocese of Detroit, but also too in my professional ministry here in the Archdiocese of Chicago with uh, very different contexts, as well as I, as I reflect on this question uh, that's been proposed to us here today. Uh, Minis, growing up uh, in the Archdiocese of Detroit, you know, uh, there was a very strong uh, African-American population. As you know, Detroit is, is one of the largest uh, Black cities in the United States with uh, almost 800,000 individuals. Uh, but out of that 800,000 uh, people who uh, reside in the city of Detroit, a very few number of them are, are Black and Catholic. And so the, the parish in some senses, it was, it was a mix between uh, black Catholic and uh, Latino, uh, myself being biracial as well, being uh, half Puerto Rican and half African American. And as I think about my own context growing up in the way in which I experienced faith and experienced life of church, certainly there were, you know, we had, we had opportunities for, for us as young people, as, as the youth to come together and to pray. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a product of Catholic schools myself, and I certainly saw the benefit uh, of, of the life of faith uh, in my own life. 
uh, strong nurturing moments in my own experience. And I think as we look at, at our context here and here in the other side of Chicago and the other side of Detroit, and even historically throughout, um, throughout the Catholic Church here in the United States when it comes to Black Catholics, we can, I think we can see how education was such a strong component of those, those avenues by which uh, African-Americans were able to come and counter with the faith and to be able to experience the faith. Um, and that was certainly a vehicle by which I too was able to uh, grow and um, though I had a very positive experience growing up in, in born and bred Catholic my entire life, my grandfather was a permanent deacon. I confess that I didn't meet a, 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 an African-American and black Catholic priest until um, I was in the seminary uh, for the Archdiocese of Chicago. Um, and as I moved here to Chicago and as I discerned my own vocation and my own call and my own discernment, um, you know, I, I had some very, very confirming moments in my own life of faith and identity uh, as, as a black man, but then also too, just as I think at any, as just as with anyone, I think there, were, I had those moments too of, of, you know, seeing, seeing the uphill battle and, and also too, just trying, trying to ensure that um, my own identity was expressed, you know, I mean, I'm thankful here that in the Arts of Chicago, you know, we're very lucky to, to have a very strong uh, black Catholic population in spite of all the things that have happened here through Renew My Church. But the context, but the context here uh, in the Arts of Chicago is sort of, but that doesn't take away the fact that, that in spite of my own experience of having a supportive uh, experience growing up and again, while I was in the seminary as well, there are still droves and droves of my own peers who have decided to, to, to take leave of the Catholic church and to find a spiritual home elsewhere. Uh, I'm 32 uh, and this is my first pastorate here in Chicago. And so I kind of come to you tonight with, with both sets, uh, with both dynamics, both as a member of the clergy then also too, as a, as a young adult myself, the people that are leaving the Catholic church, uh, both uh, my peers and also those who, um, who I'm called the shepherd, uh, I see two things happening. The first thing that I notice why, why, why black Catholics leave the Catholic church is um, certainly, you know, there, there's, there's always a question of like, do I fit in? You know, am I, do I feel at home here? Um, is my lived experience celebrated and represented in, in my peers, in the leader, another black Catholic priest until I was in the seminary. And I know for many, uh, you know, especially here in the Archdiocese of Chicago, I'm the 14th African-American priest to be ordained for the Archdiocese in our more than 150 years history, um, with Augustus Sultan being the first and then, um, you know, me being the 14th uh, more than 150 years later. Uh, another another thing that I, I think about, uh, and I'm coming this from the perspective as a young adult, uh, and maybe not even necessarily as a member of the clergy, I see a lot of my peers uh, ask themselves the question: does, does faith answer a fundamental questions that I have in my life? These these questions of who am I, who am I made to be, what is my purpose in my life, what am I called to do with this life that I have been given? Um, I think there was a presumption in previous generations that, that, we, that, that God was just kind of included in every single decision-making process, uh, both big and small in one's life. But as we continue to grow in the secularization of our world and in our society, uh, we have this dynamic. And so, and so now my peers are not seeking those, those, those answers to those bigger questions of life and faith and all that. Not in God, but they're 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 trying to seek that that faith. Uh, they're, excuse me, they're trying to seek that those answers in other things, whether that be um, you know whatever whatever the world has to give, right? Obviously, for us as Catholics and for us as Christians, yeah, obviously we know that you know God is the the giver of all things good and God is the provider of all. But there seems to be it seems to to have to been this disconnect in faith and what what the Lord and through the Church brings and answers those questions versus the longings of, of the human heart, you know, and the longings of, of, of African-Americans who, who, who profess the Catholic faith. And, and so then I, I think about then, you know, what are some kind of things that, that 
that I think about uh, that are important uh, as I do my ministry as a, as a young adult, as a Catholic priest, um, you know, as a pastor here in the Archdiocese of Chicago at here at St. Thomas. It's very central and focused to me is um, making sure that that to, to bring the, the rele relevancy of faith into the life of the common person um, and, and to show that the, the, the relevancy of faith has very real and concrete impacts in our own life. Um, not just for us as individuals, no matter what our race is, but particularly for us as African Americans, the fact that the fact that we, as as believers in Jesus Christ, can can take our own story of suffering, you know, our collective story of suffering, as that has very real implications for us, and because that has real implications for us, that begins to answer some very real and deep questions that that are within our life, and that happens to that also begins to 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 tug at the longings of the human heart. And it also tend, it also tugs at the longings of us as African-Americans and say, to say that, that the questions that I have in my own life, the struggles and the pains that I feel uh, because of my collective history, because of my collective trauma, Christ can answer those. Christ can uh, be in herself in the suffering of Christ. But that comes though, first and foremost, if we come with a life of faith, right? And so that's one of the things that I, that I, I work very, very strongly on it, you know, in my own preaching and in my own ministry here at the parish is to show the relevancy of faith within our own life and to show how the, um, how, how faith can, can really do great things uh, in our own life and begin to answer those, those longings of the heart within our own life in our own context as Black Catholics. When I pondered the question as to where have Black Catholics gone, I thought of another question, not so much where, but why? And whether they have left the church or has the church abandoned them? Speaking in the language and the lingo as a health professional, as a nurse, I have often referenced the fact that the church is hemorrhaging. I know from a medical model that when you hemorrhage and if there is nothing to stop that hemorrhage, the source of life is lost and the person dies. And so this is a major question. Where have the Black Catholics gone and why has the church abandoned them? When we think about the fact that, as Dr. Limor said, that the institutions that were historical Black parishes in Chicago are down almost to nil, the fact that we're missing the major core piece of what it means to be church, evangelization. And if evangelization is the sole purpose for the existence of the church, and we're supposed to minister and evangelize across the globe, and there is a whole segment of folk who are leaving the church, what does it say about the mission of evangelization? The why is the circumstance. Gail talks about this in the U.S. Catholic, and there's a component of the article that he wrote in reference to the Pew study. My question is why? Young folk tell you immediately it comes down to racism. It comes down to not seeing themselves represented in the sacred images of the church. For me, I think from a narrative perspective, I think back to those who evangelized me, who brought me to the baptismal font. 65 years ago, both of my godparents raised up not only just in the Catholic church, but in a church that was a historical Black Catholic church formed by Black Catholic laywomen in 1930. And yet even in the presence and in that environment of a culture and a tradition of Black folk, my godparents still left the church. My godfather died just a few days ago, and I've thought about this question for the last 40 years. How is it that those who brought me to the baptismal font me to in faith? And it comes down to the fact that their life has not always been valued, their blackness has not always been viewed as sacred, and their contributions that they bring to the altar are often rejected. So where have all the black Catholics gone? They've not, they have not left God. They've not abandoned Jesus. 
They've not abandoned the mission that Christ brought us to serve, but they have left the church that has left them unsung. And one of my commentaries often is that Mother Church has not been nearly a good alma mater to her black and brown children. She is unsunned and she has undaughtered us in many instances. And so the question needs to be asked why? If we are a universal church of all peoples, why is it that our lives and our faith and our treasures seem to matter so little and so less to the point that's invisible to the church? Thank you, Dr. Valerie. Now we will hear from Dr. Ansel Augustine. All right, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, and thank you, uh, CTU, for this invitation. And happy Black History Month to all uh, that are on this call. I want to focus on uh, our youth and young adults. That's what I was asked to speak on. As someone that has worked in youth and young adult and campus ministry for over 25 years in various capacities, I have seen even my own young people that I've raised leaving the Catholic Church for whatever reason. Um, and I want to focus on three parts, societal realities, Catholic church realities, and this is where I might lose some of my friends, our own Black Catholic realities. But as Sister Thea Bowman says, I'm here to tell the true truth. Amen. So Boy of the Gospel document, when he spoke to priests, but I want to share this with all our Catholic leadership, he told them, be shepherds with the smell of the sheep. Being shepherds with the smell of the sheep means we are in contact and in proximity and in the spaces of those sheep. Jesus, as we know throughout his ministry, met people where they were at, and that's why he was so effective. He loved them and met them in their drama and trauma and joys and celebrations and brought the joy of the gospel to those societal realities when it comes to our youth and young adults. Millennials and Gen Z, they're looking at life from a social justice lens. These are the ones that are out in the streets post George Floyd murder, out there protesting or trying to create a better society, but yet is the church standing with them? Or is the church still in our church buildings or school buildings, wherever it may be, and letting society do what it needs to do on the outside? But our youth and our young adults are out there. They're not here just to see what the church is doing just because it has always been done. They are asking the questions, why? Why should I believe in what the Catholic church teaches? Why should I believe in what is being said or done? Why? And do we as church leadership have the answers or are we willing to engage in those uncomfortable conversations with our youth and young adults? Or do we wanna be seen as the professionals and the experts and not to be seen as we really don't know? Also, we must look at what they have grown up in. The uh, presidency of President Obama or the presidency of President Trump. You know, we have to look at, they have gone through several, a couple of recessions. We have to understand that they've witnessed various scandals of leadership within the church and outside. These are also some young people that are dealing with the high cost and rising cost of living and not enough resources or, or uh, affordable jobs to help afford these type of lifestyles that uh, their predecessors and church there to meet them in those spaces and places. When we look at uh, Catholic church realities, as the previous panelists have said, and also uh, Dr. Limore, racism, the original sin of America, as the USCCB says, is a reality, but is the church addressing it? The hypocrisy of what is being said from the pulpit, but also, but versus what is the actions that are taken within society by the church have drawn some of our young people away. The reality of relationship that does or does not look like us, decisions that are made by people not from our communities about and affecting our communities, but also when we look at the pro-life issues that are there for our young people, like, are they really the pro-life issues that the Black Catholic community faces on a regular basis, whether it's gentrification, mass incarceration, educational issues, or poverty, just to name a few? 
And then finally, our Black Catholic realities. And neglect by the church in and of itself, the mess that goes on, the competition, but also the fact that many of our leaders have not taken the time to pass the torch to the next generation or raise up the next generation or empower them, even if their way of doing things is different from ours. But if we truly believe God is, everybody is made in the image and likeness of God, then God is speaking through them as well, even if it's different from ourselves. So I close by saying this. When he met with the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops at their meeting, are we in proximity with our young people? They're leaving to find spirituality elsewhere, whether it's in a Christian denomination uh, or even in African spirituality, which is gaining a resurgence as well. But are we as church there with them, meeting them wherever they're at and getting their smell on us so that we truly understand what their needs are? And my final question is this, family. Is the church you and young adults to be their authentic selves? Amen. Thank you, Dr. Ansel. And so just as a follow-up question, um, you know, I, uh, Dr. Valerie had mentioned about has the church abandoned, not why are the Black Catholics leaving, but has the church abandoned them? And I think about, you know, what you were saying, uh, Dr. Ansel, about, you know, are you young people and, and getting in the trenches and knowing exactly what's on their minds. So do you feel that we have, um, I know we've, we've alienated them. What is a way to try to bring them back? Is that for me? Whoever wants okay. to answer you, yeah, if you want to answer, that's good. Amen, no, uh, and I think that's the thing is to go where they're at. And if we don't know where they're at, that's a problem. That means that there is the gap of the communication and understanding, yes, People live here on these phones. It's fine for our churches to have active and engaging social media, which really get into that reality because of the pandemic. But where are our young people and young adults at? And are we there joining in them? You know, and you could find that stuff about every space or place, but we are called as people of faith to be in the world, but not of the world. And being in the world is being in those spaces and places and also empowering those youth and young adults that may be in our churches to help lead us and guide I do, but them telling, helping us realize what we need to do. Exactly. I, def I definitely agree with you, Dr. Uh, uh, Ansel. You know, the idea of a company that Pope Francis talks about is so important, especially in today's world, um, especially today in our Black Catholic context. You know, I, I think I think in our and our history, just for us as, as Black people, you know, we, we have a, a very strong and a, a very healthy sense of, of the elders and those who have gone before us. And that is a that is a, a wonderful moment of respect that for us as African-Americans, for us as Black people, that, that we, is a real treasure uh, that is unique for us as a culture. That high respect and that, um, that, rev that, that reverence of the ancestors to such a high degree where it removes the the daily walking with those who are living in the world right now, you know, especially our, our young people, you know, my, my peers, I think, I think they're, they're, you know, Dr. Ansel, you're right, there needs to be that, that room for us to be able to really listen to, to, to our peer, to my peers and to say, okay, you know, yes, we, we do have this, this history, this foundation in which we stand on, but there are these very real and relevant questions right now. And so instead of being, it's this, this mutuality of like, how do we listen to uh, those who are my age and younger and say, okay, what are the, what are the real needs? And to say, well, though, though the, the, the similar, though the, the, the situations may be similar, the response of today may be a little bit different than it was 25, 30, 50, 75 years ago. And so having that openness and that flexibility uh, to have that mutual conversation between the two, I think is very important. I wanted to just sort of touch into that similar conversation. One of the reasons that I have developed in ministry to the degree that I have has been in um, I initially started in, in, in ministry catechizing children, sacramental preparation. And 
it was never my intention or my interest to deal with teenagers. I, I say that honestly, and that's already 40 years ago. But it was an experience at Congress of 1997. And everyone was front and center for all of the regalia and for all of the major meetings. And the conversation was always about having to the Friday evening when the young people had their opportunity to bring their gifts to the table, the clergy were gone, the elders were gone, the clavers were gone, everyone was shing-dinging at the, at the gala that was being given by the knights and ladies of Peter Claver, and the youth of the church were really sort of left to their own devices. Mm. It was myself and a few, and mind you, I was not a youth minister at the time, but it was myself and a few you other, but in any respect, who went to join the young people, particularly a group of youth from Chicago. And it was in that moment that the Holy Spirit showed up. And so that was a lesson for me that we cannot just give lip service to wanting to make sure that our young people stay in the church, because if we're not there for them and with them, they will exit our church, which is what we are witnessing now. They've really given up on us. Yeah, and, and when I think youth services, uh, we let the youth take over, uh, trying to engage our youth more in our ministries, because a lot of our ministries are very mature giving them that space, which they are very grateful for. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of churches aren't doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, like they, they're, they're kind of pushing them to a side or, you know, they're being dragged by their parents. They really don't want to be there. They're happening for them. There is nothing for them to be engaged in. And so we tend to lose them, especially once they go to college and then try to come back. So it's, it's a challenge and, and we're not gonna say, we're not the only church that's having it, but you know, this is the church that we're in and this is our focus on tonight. And so as we have been engaging or some people have been engaging in the Senado process um, that, that the three, I um, am a little dismayed um, at the, lack of, and maybe I just haven't heard about it, of bringing Black Catholics together to actually, to bring our concerns and our gifts and our wishes and our hopes and dreams about the church through, through this synodal process. And I haven't heard of any um, invitation uh, for leaders with anyone to come together and really engage in the conversation to raise it up uh, to Rome. Has anyone else heard anything? No, and what I've heard from other similar type of gatherings, uh, I won't name them because I you know, might you know, step on toes, <laughs> but they want our black youth and young adults there to be present, but they don't want to hear them. They don't want to listen to them. Yes. They want, you know, uh, us there to say, you know, check off the dial. I do not want to hear because sometimes when our youth and our young adults speak from our Black Catholic community, it challenges the church, you know, and people don't want to be challenged. And that's that's where I've seen a, uh, a disengagement from them from these national and local gatherings. Kim, you asked the question as to whether we have been asked or if there has been an invitation. I'm going to look at that with a different look. We don't need to be asked. We know as a Black Catholic community that this process is someone asks us to bring our gifts to the table, to voice our own action, our own voice, and our own agency. Those of us who are either in traditional Black Catholic parishes or even in parishes of the dominant culture, we have the responsibility to sing our song and to tell our story. No one can tell our story but us. 
And if we continue to wait for someone to invite us to a table that has never been set for us, so my suggestion is these processes are going on. Some of the dioceses may have not been as active as others, but you know what? You don't need an invitation. Just move on in, take your seat and tell your story. Because if we do not, at the end, we cannot say that our needs were not heard because we have not made a process of presenting them. Amen. I, I, I certainly hear you on that. And I, at least here in the Archdiocese of Chicago, I, that's, that's, that's a tough one to swallow, right? Because it's, it's um, you know, we, we do a lot of heavy lifting here at the parish to, to collect the information for, to send it to the Archdiocese. And the Archdiocese has to combine all that to um, a small document, which goes to the USCCB, which further collect, which further aggregates and collects what the 195 dioceses we have here in the United States into something smaller, which then gets compounded against with the other Episcopal conferences in the world. So, uh, but when you, when, when you look at us in the universal context, that's a lot of voices to, to, to bring to the table. I wonder though, uh, as a reframing though, um, what is it, the, I think the question that, that I ask myself as a minister is, you know, what is it that I'm doing on the local level to, to make voices mm -hmm. heard, right? You know, here at St. Thomas the Apostle, we're a third African-American, we're, uh, we're a third white, and we're a third everything else, you know? And so it's kind of keeping all of those those communities in tension uh, and, and having everyone have a seat in God's love uh, here at St. Thomas. And I know many other parishes, not just here in the area of Chicago, but across the, across the United States, um, you know, live live in that reality as well. You know, and so I think I think sometimes you know we, it's very easy to put the blame and the onus on the people above. And yes, there if there needs to be blame, there rightly so should be blame. But the but the reframing, and I think the the real world the rubber meets the road is certainly with, within the life of the parish, and the life of our own Catholic institutions, where 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 people really have this encounter, um, Christ through the context of community, and so then highlighting and celebrating those gifts within our own local community. Even sometimes when um, our voices sometimes get lost in the in the larger context. Definitely, and I, I do believe in also, um, like you say, coming at the local level, at the grassroots level, um, bringing our our concerns, our thoughts, and actually putting our plan in action and doing it. I mean, one of the things that. Um, um, we had a Black Catholic convocation where all the churches in the diocese came together at uh, De La Salle High School. And for two days, we, we met and talked about evangelization and stewardship and, and the potential of knowing that our churches were getting smaller back in 2000, 22 years ago, um, that we would need to come up with a plan to consolidate our churches the way we would like it to go. It fell through the crew. And so in 2016, we get the archdiocesan plan of Renew My Church. And here we are. So as thinking about our future and our legacy, I know we, we talked about in the XA is probably many more reasons why uh, Black Catholics are leaving the church. And even I know in through this Renew My Church process, a lot of uh, especially our older Catholics are, are feeling disenfranchised and not heard. They've been through closings year after year and they get discouraged and despondent and they're like, look, I'm through. But if we were to say something to them, if we had a word for them to just really just try to, you know, say, you know, we hear you, we see you and you are important to us, what would we say to them? Your faith has made you whole. Okay. Because in the actuality that under the sun, and these circumstances that we're experiencing even today, even some suffering and closing of parishes, but the important thing is the, the endurance, the perseverance of the faith. 
You know, we sing that song, we've come this way by faith, and that's the faith of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. It's the faith of our elders. And they know sometimes better than we how, as the song says, how we got over. But I think that there needs to be that blending of our youth, the concerns of our elders, because if there is not that bridging together, mm -hmm. we, we are lost. We lose whole periods of narrative stories of faith, or even ways how to counteract some of the pushback that we're getting as we begin to become an enculturated church in the full authentic identity of what it means to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. I would just want to tell our elders this presence, thank you for your sacrifice, thank you for the foundations that you've laid or built upon so that we could have a foundation and that we need your wisdom and we need your presence. Even if the church continues to beat us up for whatever reasons and different experiences that we've all gone through, we need you. And the younger generation, even though there's that gap, you know, there's some of us in the middle trying to bridge that gap and we need that because we're getting beat up on both sides trying, but we need y'all. And thank you for your service and your ministry and God bless you. So, uh... Uh, both of my esteemed colleagues the same you know you know thank you for thank you for laying the foundation of faith you know thank you for bringing us to the waters of baptisms and showing us um, what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ first and foremost because that's what that's what we as church are called to do first and foremost as people of faith to have a deep abiding relationship with Jesus Christ mm -hmm. so thank you thank you for that for that sharing of that relationship um, and and I'd say I'd also say to my elders you know um, thank you for for being strong in the in this of of um, you know the the choppy waters uh, of life and uh, of history, um, and thank you for supporting us as we continue to navigate these new waters uh, of faith, uh, the, this new reality that that we're living in. And yes, you know we looked we look to you for 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 guidance, for support, for for the continual lifting up. Um, but also thank you for that freedom to to let us spread our own wings uh, to be able to to live and to navigate in this new reality that we are here in 2022. When you ask that question about where have not just Black Catholics have gone, but where have we gone within the interior context of who we are as we exist in this year of 2022, our own struggles, whether I stay or do I go? Mm. Do I stay or do I go? Because at 65 years old, I can very much tap into the feelings and the concerns of those youth who were so than they were, you know, 20 years ago. Um, my son, spiritual son over there, Ansel knows what I'm talking about. But remembering what it was like to be a young 20 something year old black Catholic and in a church who did not respect my black Catholic womanist voice in a sense. And for those periods of times where I separated myself from the institutional church because I needed to do that wound healing as uh, the late Reverend Kate generation that we continue to still live in because no one has realized just how deep the scar goes. And so when we ask the question, where have all the black Catholics gone? I think we need to talk about a revisionist understanding of what Catholic identity is. Because until we have an authentic identity about what it really means to be, Father Massengale says, authentically Catholic and radically black, and he and I bounce back and forth with that, because Catholic. we have to be the Catholic people that trouble the waters, not concerned about whose steps we walk in if those steps are not ordered according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that we're a church of tradition and faith, but some of our traditions are problematic. Hmm. When Catholic identity is from a Eurocentric model, when enculturation is looked at as being bad. If you want in places where their blackness, mm -hmm. their spirituality, their ethos is respected.
by a God who created them in their blackness, in his image, or in God's image and likeness. And so those are the deeper theological and spiritual questions that need to be asked. What is it that we need to do as church to heal the wound mm. and to let our people know that within the Eucharistic celebration that they can and we have to also be the owners to challenge those who pastor our churches, whether they be black, white, or brown, that they have got to preach the gospel of Jesus in an authentic manner that addresses the people in their social location, whether they be children, youth, old enough to understand, as Nehemiah would say, or those of us who have gotten our faith from our grandparents and our mothers, because we are a communion of saints. And this Thank you. I want to leave some time for now to, to go to uh, questions uh, from our audience in the Zoom world. Um, I, uh, Gardas has been monitoring our chat box. I asked anybody to put questions in the chat box. And, and so Gardas, uh, can you give us a question? Okay, uh, so one of the first earlier questions is, considering the social justice teaching the church has produced, I wonder if the speakers could address the shift in emphasis within the church and its neglect of its social justice teaching and heritage. That's a good question. I, I think one thing that kind of comes to mind immediately is, you know, when there was a, um, when, when, the, when Catholic social teaching be, began its, its, its presence, you know, uh, over 150 years ago, and as it continued to develop, uh, you know, I think there was an inherit, uh, inherited uh, understanding that, that of, of, a, of, a, of a Christian understanding of life, right? Uh, not, ju not just by those who ascribe to Catholic social teaching, but, but it just, again, like a general, like, Christian ethos or a general Christian or a general like kind of people of goodwill and you know understanding of of of, of a life of faith um, not just in the Catholic context but again I think in the larger community and as I think as we become more and more secular much present and certainly very much needed I think more so now than ever but I think where that shift has happened is that since there's been this secularization this loss of this the general understanding of faith and God and kind of the, these these um, these kind of basic tenets of of you know the presence of God and and because there's a presence of God there's this these fundamental things that we believe about ourselves and one another and as a community things like that I think I think that shift is happening because the church has unfortunately has to go on the defensive so we're not just saying that okay work more towards Catholic social teaching but now I think the church is having to retreat and say well we have to prove that there's a God first and foremost, and that, that Christ, uh, that the person of Jesus Christ is real, and that the person of Jesus Christ has a real impact for us as a people of faith, right? So because, because we've lost those individual, because we've lost that, that, that basic knowledge of who God is and what, what God is doing for us in life, you know, we're having to do both at the same time. We're having to show the existence of God, and the importance of God in life of the church. And all. I guess I see it from a different perspective, continuing to do theology with young people. My perspective is if we were living the CST teachings, that would give a reality of who God is. If we spoke to the principles of the sanctity and dignity of human life and all life from the womb to the tomb, and not just focus on the mediocrity of just one aspect of what it means to be sacred in life, it would be a new we set up a contradiction with our Catholic social teachings when we put more emphasis on one value aspect of life and we forget about the needs of the other aspects and sanctity of the human condition. I'm pro-life, but I'm pro-life radically and authentically. I've spent 40 plus years bringing babies into the world. But I also wanna see those same babies fed. I also wanna see those same mothers provided 
how ages who are struggling with uh, pregnancy to know that they're going to be loved and not condemned. I also want to be able to see that when my black and brown brothers are shedding blood down in the street, that our bishops stand up and say that their black lives matter, as opposed to calling our search and seeking of justice a pseudo religion. And I would like to see those same bishops who stand in solidarity to challenge the dis or really means. And so God is, and those who may not, you know, profess to a faith in reference to an institutionalized doctrine or dogma, they understand that God lives, but they don't know whether the church lives because the church has not been nearly consistent in living out the teachings of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I echo, you know, my mama took my thunder, but that's all right. <laughs> you know, it's all right. But you know, where I've seen other than with make have the church that they love do the right thing that they see that they hear preached from the uh, pulpit when they were they're growing up or whether they're still there. I think one of the most passionate and powerful groups I've ever ministered within, of course, the pandemic has put a hold on it is the prisons, you know, when I've done prison retreats, and these men, uh, specifically, I mean, the men, male prisons here in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, New Orleans is number one for mass incarceration. And yet we are the state of Louisiana is either 49th or 50th in education. So the school, to prison, where's the church in addressing those things? But yet when I see these men coming out and I'm, we're preaching and teaching them that they're made in the image and likeness of God and blah, blah, blah. When they come out, if they come out of the system and they're trying to get their lives back on track, there is hardly any resources put in place to help them be uh, quote unquote effective citizens. You know, and yet they go back to the realities of what they have to do and end up getting back. And it's mostly our black and brown men. So many of my young people, this is a pro-life. You had to deal and address, go into a life of crime and are in the system because of the lack of opportunities and resources here. Whereas we as church, you know, and then there are suburbs right outside that have some of the most wealthiest parishes, but yet we are here and I'm in Treme, the oldest black neighborhood. This is where my home parish, St. Peter Claver is. Um, but yet we are left to just fend for ourselves. And sometimes we feel in the regards of, you know, and I know the question talks about where did the change happen? Uh, I don't know if the change actually happened because I, you know, I grew up in the, uh, the matter is I do not see the same priorities being given to the needs of our youth and young adults from our community and those realities that our youth and young adults face. Amen. Oh, another question, Gardas? Okay, the next question is, I'm wondering how we might address racism in truthful ways as a church to better meet the needs of youth and young adults. I think, you know, this is always a tricky question because the church never liked stack at themselves and that's what youth and young adults do but i think the most effective way is to let the youth and young adults lead the conversation as i said before let them lead let them teach let us hear what they have to say and let us hear what their solutions are and not only listen but act on it as well i think about myself as, as life of a priest and i think just part part of answering that question in terms of like dealing with you know, the sin of racism is, you know, the onus, the onus is on me is to not be afraid to preach on it and to preach on it with, um, with a holy honesty, but also preach on it with a holy boldness too. Um, you know, knowing our own history, knowing our own past um, and, and, and addressing that, you know, because I think, I think, I think uh, my, my peers and those younger than I, you know, they, they are not afraid to take their lead, but there's also they also look for leadership, right? You know, and and if if I through my own preaching and, and through others who preach or who are called to preach, um, it, it, you know, it, that has real damaging effects for us as the as the the body of Christ. Um, and so I, you know, I think about my own work as a priest and you know how that onus is on me to to do that as well. The other component in addressing this sin of racism globally and in the church is that there has to be some truth telling. There has to be some dialogue. There has to be some teaching. 
we have some documents, the most recent one, and we have us who are impacted most by the sin of racism do not feel as if that document really spoke to the inner context and the needs and the suffering and the trauma that we have experienced as black and brown peoples in this church and in this world. And yet that document is held up as if it's the Holy Grail and it's not. Within our own archdiocese here in Newark last November, there were four week sessions for deaneries and that means the deans of the deanery dialogue. You can't learn how to address the sin of racism if you're not willing to even come into the conversation. I don't need to preach to myself in the choir. And I don't need to be misfix it because I didn't break it. But we have to hold our church up for accountability because it is our church. We are a part of the fabric that formed this Catholic church here in the America came here in our black skin. And so we have to hold the church accountable. We have to preach and teach with an unbridled tongue. We have to be able to tell the truth and not be afraid of what might fall down upon us because we come from ancestors, okay, who went through much more than we could ever begin to talk about. But even those of us who were in historically black Catholic churches, because I attend by black Catholic laywomen, and even in the context of my own parish church, there are things that we don't often call out because we tend to be a people that are sort of hospitable and don't want to rock the boat sometime or hurt someone's feelings. But remember, we are people who believe in a Jesus Christ who flipped over tables when injustice took place in the sanctuary. So I'll leave that there. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, my heart breaks listening to how the white Catholic church has excluded, turned our backs on black Catholics. I'm aware that this has been a part of church experience and I want to listen, know, and celebrate the life and faith experiences of black Catholics. What can I do to welcome all brothers and sisters into the faith and church? I think, you know, one of the things that, that And, and even in their pew uh, study, they look for a welcoming church. Um, and there's not necessarily if it's all black or, or multicultural, but they look for a welcoming church. They look for, uh, like I said, to hear sermons that are relevant to their life. Um, so I think if, if you're welcoming, um, that's the first step. You know, um, I, at, at I, uh, uh, I am the associate minister at St. Sebastian. A theme back in the day, see how they love one another. And when you come into the church, people feel welcomed. It didn't matter from what, <clears throat> excuse me, what walk of life you came from. But people always felt welcome. But unfortunately, as being a black Catholic going into probably a predominantly uh, white church, a lot of times we weren't welcomed. And so if we can just be welcomed by you sometimes, it, it's, just, it's just, you know, a sincere welcome, not just a sincere welcome. I would echo, um, you know, whenever I get asked the question from uh, white colleagues about what they can do about racism is you have the ability to talk to your fellow family and friends, mm -hmm. you know, other white people, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I quote uh, my friend uh, and my supervisor, uh, Bishop Fernand Cherie here in New Orleans, are, are, it's a white problem, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and the people that have the control to address racism are white people, you know, we can teach and preach, but we're the, uh, we're affected by it, people of color, you know, and so, you know, go to the black Catholic spaces, be there knowing, you know, you're there, not in a non-judgmental way and just experience and learn. Um, but 
to go back to your own communities and hold them accountable because those conversations, those decision-making spaces, though you're more likely to be in those places and can advocate for us when we can't. And so, so one of the things that's taken place within Black History Month here in the Archdiocese of Newark is that our Office of Black Catholic Ministries made a concerted decision that instead of celebrating our Black Catholic traditional mass here at the cathedral, we were taking our gifts, our treasures, our history, our songs to four specific areas within the diocese that are considered more dominant culture churches. Father Bozeman, who is a combination of Philly, New Orleans, and now LA, came to visit one of our parishes in a mostly upward uh, dominant culture parish. My phone has not stopped ringing since Father Bozeman left here. This coming Sunday, Father Maurice Nutt will preach the homily at St. Peter's University's Chapel of St. Aidan's Church. And so we are making a decision Maybe if we extend outside of the traditional church that we're accustomed to and letting our gifts be more visible to those who may be a little tenuous about coming to us, that that might be the welcome mat for them to come to us and for us to continue to go to them. I certainly echo uh, both of those, you know, the importance of um, you know, the importance of it, you know, expanding our reach and, and you know, of our blackness and, and our Catholicity, you know, to, to, to other groups, you know, and, and, you know, Dr. Ansel, I think, I think you're absolutely right, you know, just not be not being afraid of being that bridge um, to, to be a welcoming community where, where, where those of other races can, can come and experience the gifts that, that we bring as black Catholics. And then, and then again, sharing those gifts out uh, and, and, and telling others of the great things that God is doing within our own community. Okay. Um, next. Thanks for Ansel. We grew up with, we've come this far by faith. Do you think that our emerging leaders will see that song or a new one? Can you repeat the question that I, heard? I didn't hear the last part? Okay. So question for Dr. Ansel. Mm -hmm. We grew up with, we've come this far by faith. Do you think that our emerging leaders will see that song or a new one? Oh, they definitely need a new one. Um, where our young people and young adults are, emerging leaders, as you call them, they have their own. I put together, you know, the things that some of the things that they've experienced when I listed some of the presidencies and tragedies and blessings and things that have gone on. But their mind is this. The way that even they receive information is different. So even just even the pop culture, music wise, or even just culturally is different. Yes, you know, I, you know, I come from a church where, you know, we had Kinte Cloth, our parish school, St. Peter Claver Catholic School, unfortunately it closed uh, two, two and a half years ago. We used to have Kinte Cloth as part of the, um, things are there and those things are important and many of those young people are raised, but the way they grew up is different from the way I grew up. So to my answer to that question is different, but as I've said throughout this conversation, we need to let them lead us into what they need. Let them develop their own story, their own narrative, and let them develop the ways and the process of which we can assist and, as Father Michael Trail said, accompany them. Any other questions? Yeah, we, 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 got, we got some. So the next question is, how can you ask young people to come back if we have not changed our practices? Well, that's a good question. I'm gonna be honest, I stopped asking. I stopped asking. As I said, I started off doing youth, uh, children's ministry and then moved into doing youth and young adult ministry for almost, would get on the phone and meet me at the rectory and call and ask them to come. And they were very faithful for coming for a very long time. But 
it's like an invitation. If I invite somebody to my home, I bring them to my home and I treat them with hospitality and I feed them and I give them to drink and, you know, I love up on them. But I'm going to use the language of my spiritual son, Ansel, will the church we love, love us back? Because they still believe in God. And they still witness and praise God in their way and their own contextuality. But how can I truthfully invite somebody back into a church that has not opened the door for them? Do I continue to pray that they stay grounded and rooted in their faith? I do. Do I continue to give them spiritual direction and guidance and a, a gentle you know, invitation, come and meet me on Sunday? I do. has to be watered with the broader church's respect and love for our young and black and brown youth and young adults. The church has to send out the invitation to let them know that you do matter. Right. I, I've been looking at the comments uh, in the chat section as you know, as we've been going through tonight as well. And um, I apologize. I don't know who it is. I think it might have been some someone earlier tonight. Uh, uh, social teaching and um, one of our commenters reached uh, asked one of the young adults who was in their parish. I think the person who was asking was a priest. And the answer that that person that that priest, I believe, got from that young adult was um, more of a desire for adoration, more of a desire for opportunities for prayer. And so I, I, I think I think I think, you know, as, as I've said earlier, having that openness. And I think another piece to, to it um, is you may not get the answer that you think you're, that you're going to get. You're not going to, you may have our own experiences and especially the experiences of my elders, you know, they, they might have this, there might be this longing need for something that might fill them. Right. But again, you know, the, if, if our, if our, if our, if the whole point of, of us being a church to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, um, you know, that relationship with Jesus Christ looks lots of different ways. And so what it may be for one generation may not be for another. And so maybe maybe for one, one subset of, of, of our Black brothers and sisters, it might be more of a need to, to deal with social issues. To if, 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 a, if a subset of that group comes and say, hey, we would, we would like prayer and prayer should look a certain way. Not closing ourselves off to say that, well, just because we think we had that answer already in our mind, uh, what we think they need, um, you know, being open to, to actually hearing, hearing uh, the, the young adults who are seeking that, that life of faith and to say, you know, if you're looking for an opportunity for prayer uh, and what that looks like, they, you know, that we can make that available for them. Because here, here's the thing, you know, pe people leave the small reasons for personal reasons for anything else in between, right? And we all know and we believe that faith is a journey. But we're also mindful too that that, that, you know, Dr. Ansel, you're absolutely right, you know, like, this is a powerful tool, and that so many people, whether they leave the church purposefully or just through lack of uh, practice or lack of ardor, um, there's, they can still research, they still look, they still say, okay, well, even if I fundamentally disagree about what the Catholic Church teaches on racism or sexism or this or that or, or anything else in between, you know, they still look, okay. comes back to the church and says, Hey, I'd like I'd like to try this as my entry point to get back into the life of the church. Not calling that because it doesn't answer the person who's hearing that's need. Amen. I echo that, you know, and but I want to reiterate what uh, Ms. Valerie said is I stopped asking them to come back, and I try to be the presence of the church in their daily lives, whether it's. I hear they're having a birthday party or whatever. And, oh, Mr. Answer, you came. Good. You know, glad you're here. Blah blah blah. And I make the invitation. I miss you at church. Church, Mr. Ansel is at the back of church ushering to welcome them back home um, and hopefully guide them through whatever uh, journey they're on when they come back. And touching on that also, um, Dr. Ansel, is, is going back to what you said in the very beginning, meeting folk where they are. Our young people, our young adults, our middle-aged adults, and many of us seniors have left the church, not that we have left Jesus. And when that invitation of bringing Jesus to those who are sick and homebound, 
We bring the love of Jesus to folk also who, for whatever reason, don't want to cross that threshold of the structured body church. But we continue to bring church to them in the presence of who we are. And I think that in this new millennium, we have to begin to think how to be church outside of the maintenance and the mission of four walls. We, we, we have to rethink. I mean, if COVID has done nothing else, mm -hmm. it is poor we could not get into the building structure of the church. It has taught us how to be Eucharist to each other when we could not go and get Eucharist. And so I think that as we evolve and begin to develop maybe a new kind of way of being church, you know, the, the Black Sisters Conference some years ago had a t-shirt that said, you know, Black church on solid ground. And so we, we, we need to think that to belong to a God who is a radically God. He's always the same, but he changes things in us. And we need to think, what is it that we can do to be that radical change in the church where we can bring church and bring Christ to others? Okay. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll do a wrap up. All right. So the next question is, what about the lack of racially diverse images in Catholic churches? <laughs> Just We've had me. a black mural at St. Sabina for a yeah. long time. So black yeah, Jesus up there with the hands outstretched. So, uh, yeah. I belong to a Black Catholic faith community, Christ the King, Jersey City. Whenever you're in New York, you can come 10 minutes across the river and come visit us. Our stations of the cross are a combination of oil depictions of Christ and the Adinkra symbols hmm. created by one of our youth who's now a 40-year-old hmm. because she is a graduate of our crucifix is a resurrected ebony cross. Our Madonna is a black Madonna with a baby Jesus hanging off of her hips. And our sacred heart is an exposed sacred heart of a black Christ. We have to begin to re replicate ourselves in the sacredness because the one thing that young people do, they take notice. And yeah. if they don't see themselves represented in the sacredness, th they discount it as being truthful. My niece was married in July, were Catholic, but had never been to a black Catholic church or were Protestant and had never been to a Catholic church period. And there were some who had just never been in the church and some were Jewish and some were Muslim. But the most profound thing that struck them was the imagery of the sacredness in black in that sanctuary. No, mm -hmm. oh, amen. Uh, here at St. Peter Claver is the same. Uh, many of you that may have come down to New Orleans and visited our parish. It's the same, those images of black Jesus uh, uh, is on the mural on our school uh, that's not open, but the school mural on top of the uh, building was done by one of our former students, you know, as, as a young adult now, and he took his time to do that. And of course, the images of the Madonna and just different images of uh, Treme in our neighborhood. But uh, real quick story, when I was at one of the campus ministry places that I served as campus minister, I won't say where, but it was one of the most diverse universities in the country, Catholic, non-Catholic, but yet they had all these images of white Jesus, but yet you have all this diverse population in several meeting spaces and places. I just started hanging up images of the six on the road to canonization. I would order images of, uh, you know, Black Jesus, Black images, or even Native American and other mm -hmm. versions just hung them up. And I dared them to take it down. But the fact of the matter is, there was that boldness that I've felt from my ancestors. If these young people don't see themselves, why would they want to connect? And that's the important thing is, people need to see themselves. If we're truly made in the image and likeness of God, well, guess what? There's nothing wrong with these images exactly. being up. Uh, there's a gentleman, Ralph Moore has had his hand up. Uh, in the I back mean, there, Ralph Moore, perhaps he doesn't know how to unmute himself. No, he, he asked his question. I've, 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 I've been muted. I just wanted to say very quickly that I think you you finally got to the point of, of uh, why the young people are disinterested and distanced from the churches. They don't see anything that looks like them. And, you know, we've done some things in Black Catholic churches, you know, it's the, you see a lot more around the country than you did before. 
they don't see any images of anybody of color. That's in most Catholic churches. So when the white person asks, what can we do? One of the first things they can do is to find some images of black Catholic saints, uh, candidates for sainthood and put them up. You know, so that when people walk into churches, they can see that uh, uh, the church has diverse images and that the, the clear suggestion uh, is that heaven is a diverse place and not just for white people. Uh, but, but I have a quick thing very quickly. I know we're, we're getting ready to finish up. Uh, you know, we used to have CYOs when I was a young person. Uh, that's, that's what brought young people to church. We would have a CYO meeting on Wednesday night, Catholic Youth Organization, and we didn't pray. We just danced and got to, you know, socialize and ate and, and all that kind of thing. But we got to find uh, ways to reach out and not preach out to, to kids. The young people listen to rap stars more than they listen to a lot of preachers uh, uh, and all. That's the reality. They're hearing and all. They're talking. And I, I, I go to church every Sunday and I never hear about what's going on out in the city of Baltimore. That's where I'm, I'm from. Finally, we've had a letter campaign for the last two or three months to Pope Francis to canonize those six black Catholic saints. And everybody on this call should, should uh, look and get my email and contact us at St. Anne Church in Baltimore. Because what would draw not only young people, but other people uh, to church would be to know that people are them. They told us to sit in the back and it was a whole different day until we said, we're not gonna sit in the back of the church anymore. And we're gonna keep applying to seminaries even though they wouldn't, wouldn't have us in. So we have to assert ourselves more and that might make us, uh, and if Father says, no, I don't want you to put up a Black Lives Matter sign, or no, I don't want you to put up a picture of Mother Lang or, or, or Father Augustus Tolton in the church, you say to him, we're gonna do it anyway. And I'm not trying to go against priest, but no, they can't tell us that we can't ourselves. You know, the Catholic church has to be uh, uh, taught what experiences we've had as black Catholics. We've been through enslavement, we've been through mass incarceration, mass poverty and, and segregation inside the churches. And so I'm just suggesting these days that maybe we should have a copy of John Hope Franklin's book and have the priest read that. that. Uh, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, 1619 materials and a woman named Carol Anderson who talks Thank Black you. American progress. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, we appreciate your comments. And on that, we're going to end.